Nativity, O Christ our God. Welcome to this special episode of the All Around Growth Podcast. With the Nativity Fast beginning last Friday, November 15th, this season of spiritual preparation and reflection offers a meaningful opportunity to realign our lives. In light of this, I've decided to take a brief hiatus from our regular podcast schedule. During this time, I'll be dedicating more attention to family, prayer, and the practices that draw us closer to God in this sacred season. Today, we'll be exploring an article by Father Stephen Kostoff titled, Acedia, Us, and Our Lenten Effort. While it primarily addresses Great Lent, its discussion of the spiritual affliction of acedia, a condition that parallels what we often refer to today as depression, raises thought-provoking questions about their connection. The insights offered in this article are profoundly relevant not only for the Nativity Fast, but also for our daily lives. Father Kostoff's reflections invite us to confront feelings of restlessness, disengagement, and apathy through the transformative practices of prayer and genuine care for others. Join us as we read this article together, reflect on its timeless wisdom, and share how it relates to our journey through this fasting season. Let's begin. Acedia, Us, and Our Lenten Effort The season of Great Lent is the time of the soul's awakening from the sleep of sin, or from sheer indifference, apathy, or what the saints call acedia, a condition of spiritual torpor or unsatisfied restlessness. Is this a term from our spiritual vocabulary that you are familiar with? I have a book stored in my library that I am finally beginning to read this great Lent, titled Acedia and Me, A Marriage, Monks, and a Writer's Life. The author is Kathleen Norris, who has developed a strong reputation as an insightful writer on religious themes through such books as Dakota, A Spiritual Biography, and The Cloister Walk, to name just two of her more prominent titles. She also has a book with the intriguing title, The Quotian Mysteries, Laundry, Liturgy, and Women's Work, a series of lectures based on discovering the sacred in what are considered mundane domestic chores. Her career began as a poet, and she is now usually described as an oblate of the Assumption Abbey in North Dakota. This series of books on religious themes, beginning with Dakota in 1992, trace her growing Christian faith and her contact with certain Roman Catholic monastic communities in North America, especially the Benedictine one mentioned above. In Acedia and Me, she has chosen to write about the passion of Acedia in its contemporary understanding and setting in its almost universal affliction of the modern person, usually as the condition that we now call depression, a very orthodox Christian theme to be sure. This passion was discovered and written about in the earliest years of the monastic movement by the Desert Fathers, who analyzed this passion and offered guidance on how to overcome it. This was the, quote, noonday demon, close quote, mentioned in the Psalms, with whom the desert aesthetics had to do battle with before they could grow spiritually. By far the most famous description is found in the writings of Evagrius of Pontus, from his work The Practicos. Quote, the demon of Acedia, also called the noonday demon, is the one that causes the most serious trouble of all. He presses his attack on the monk about the fourth hour and besieges his soul until the eighth hour. First of all, he makes it seem that the sun barely moves, if at all, and that the day is fifty hours long. Then he constrains the monk to look constantly out his windows, to walk outside the cell, to gaze carefully at the sun to determine how far it stands from the ninth hour or lunchtime, to look this way and now that to see if perhaps one of his brethren appears from his cell. Then, too, he instills in the heart of a monk the hatred for this place, a hatred for his very life itself, a hatred for manual labor. He leads him to reflect that charity has departed from among his brethren, that there is no one to give him encouragement. Should there be someone at this period who happens to offend him in some way or other, this too the demon uses to contribute further to his hatred. 
This demon drives him along to desire other sites where he can more easily procure life's necessities, more readily find work and make a real success of himself. He goes on to suggest that, after all, it is not the place of, that is the basis of pleasing the Lord. God is to be adored everywhere. He joins to these reflections of the memory of his dear ones and of his former way of life. He depicts life stretching out for a long period of time and brings before the mind's eye the toil of the aesthetic struggle and, as the saying has it, leaves no leaf unturned to induce the monk to forsake his cell and drop out of the fight. No other demon follows close upon the heels of this one when he is defeated, but only a state of deep peace and inexpressible joy arise out of this struggle. Close quote. Here we find boredom, tedium, restlessness, impatience, and a lack of care, all making prayer undesirable and impossible. In this condition, we are seemingly overwhelmed by the futility of our efforts. No wonder that this passage is often quoted today, for it remains quite a penetrating psychological and spiritual analysis of a malady that can easily be transposed from the world of the desert aesthetics into the world as we know and live in today. This is basically the purpose of Kathleen Norris's book. In fact, Norris writes the following about the passage from Evagrius. Quote, As I read this, I felt a weight lift from my soul, for I had just discovered an accurate description of something that had plagued me for years, but that I had never been able to name. Close quote. She begins by relating modern definitions of the word acedia, which had remained in our vocabulary over the centuries, though not readily used. Quote, the ancient word acedia, which in Greek simply means the absence or lack of care, has proved anything but simple when it comes to finding adequate expression in English. Modern writers tend to leave the term untranslated, or employ the latter Latin acedii. A few examples may help the reader comprehend the broad range of meaning of the word as it is currently understood. Close quote. The Oxford English Dictionary, the second edition in 1989, defines acedia as quote, heedlessness, torpor, a non-caring state, close quote. while Webster's third new international dictionary of the English language, unabridged, published in 1976, defines it as quote, anxiety, grief, the deadly sin of sloth, spiritual torpor, and apathy, close quote. And according to the Online Medical Dictionary, published in 2000, acedia is defined as a, quote, mental syndrome, the chief features of which are listlessness, carelessness, apathy, and melancholia, close quote. Interestingly, and I would add unfortunately, I could not find the word in the dictionary I have at hand, which is the Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, 10th edition, published in 1997. Perhaps the editors did not envision college students looking up acedia. Bustling and energetic college campuses may just offer enough superficial relief from acedia so as to leave it undetected until later in life. And a computer culture has a very restricted spiritual vocabulary. Be that as it may, Kathleen Norris is determined to get to the roots of this condition in both its historical and modern expressions. As she puts it at the beginning of her exploration, quote, I think it is likely that much of the restless boredom, frantic escapism, commitment phobia, and enervating despair that plagues us today is the ancient demon of acedia in modern dress. The boundaries between depression and acedia are notoriously fluid, at the risk of oversimplifying, I would suggest that while depression is an illness treatable by counseling and medication, acedia is a vice that is best countered by spiritual practice and the discipline of prayer. Christian teachings concerning acedia are a source of strength and encouragement to me. Close quote. If acedia in the original Greek literally means lack of care, it may do well to understand the simple but deep term care that we readily use. Here again, it is a probing paragraph from Norris. Quote, the person afflicted with acedia refuses to care or is incapable of doing so. 
When life becomes too challenging and engagement with others too demanding, acedia offers a kind of spiritual morphine. You know the pain is there, yet you can't rouse yourself to give a damn. That it hurts to care is born out of its etymology, for care derives from an Indo-European word meaning to cry out, as in lament. Caring is not passive, but an assertion that no matter how strained and messy our relationships can be, it is worth something to be present with others doing our small part. Care is also required for the daily routine that acedia would have us deny as meaningless repetition or too much bother. Close quote. In closing her opening chapter, Kathleen Norris offers a summary of what I would imagine themes in the book in its totality may explore. Quote, Yet I have come to believe that acedia can strike anyone whose work requires self-motivation and solitude. Anyone who remains married, for better or for worse. Anyone determined to stay true to a commitment that is sorely tested in everyday life. Close quote. And I wonder, do we stay so busy so as to unconsciously flee from the noonday demon of acedia? Do we fill up our time and our lives with endless activity because we feel that dreadful acedia creeping up on us? Or is it the acedia that drives us forward so restlessly to always be doing something, anything, because we no longer have the ability to be still, to truly rest as God and the saints described in a life of prayer and stillness. The Lenten prayer of the church, so deeply focused as in the canon of repentance of St. Andrew of Crete, is one weapon that we have to do battle with the demon of acedia and other forms of spiritual torpor and apathy. In the darkened and prayerful atmosphere in the church that signifies the Lenten season, we are able to concentrate and be still, at least to some extent, as the moving forward of repentance and compunction move over us and actually plant themselves in our hungry and thirsty souls, souls that can only be filled by God. Just some passing thoughts on this article titled Acedia, Us and Our Lenten Effort. I felt that this article was appropriate because Sometimes the Nativity Fast is referred to as the Little Lent. The fasting practices are the same, but we do them for a shorter period of time. This article, which I had never read before, left me feeling that I'm in agreement with a lot of what Kathleen Norris has to say. I agree that Perhaps it is the case that we stay so busy so as to unconsciously flee from the noonday demon of acedia. Perhaps we do fill up our time and our lives with endless activity because we feel that dreadful acedia creeping up on us. Perhaps it is the acedia itself that drives us forward so restlessly to be always doing something, anything, because we no longer have the ability to be still, to truly rest in God, as the saints described, a life of prayer and stillness. It's the fasting seasons that the church has throughout the year that allow me to contemplate things like this, because that acedia, that depression, as some might call it in the modern day, is something that leaves us less of what we could be. I think that modern day depression and acedia are incredibly connected, if not one and the same. And again, I would encourage all of you who are listening to this to follow the link in the show notes and read this for yourself and reflect on it as well. Thank you for joining us today as we reflected on Father Stephen Kostoff's insights about acedia and the challenges of fasting, a topic that resonates deeply during this nativity season. As we pause our recordings to embrace the spirit of the season, I want to wish you all a blessed and meaningful time of preparation for the celebration of Christ's birth. We'll be back with a new episode on New Year's Eve, 
ready to share updates and dive into the topics that inspire growth in our lives and our community. In the meantime, we'll still be hosting our monthly video calls for Patreon subscribers on the last Tuesday of each month, and these calls are a great way to connect in a casual and friendly setting. If you'd like to join us, consider supporting the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash allaroundgrowth. Until then, may your days be filled with peace, prayer, and purpose. We'll see you on New Year's Eve. This is Rob Kaiser. Thank you, and God bless. Amen.